So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. Um, and also, I envy all of you that will stay for two weeks. Uh, unfortunately, I had to stay for a shorter time. Um, and uh, uh, since it's a summer school, instead of presenting um, the most recent complicated calculation I have been doing, I decide to uh, give a little bit of an overview of uh, what we have been doing for uh, a certain dispersity equation that you can see, you can look at in terms of a or as an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. Um, so I will be speaking 45 minutes. This talk was presented for 50, so I will just go faster. Don't worry about it. I will, no, I will skip you things <coughs> that are not really as important as the rest. So this is a little bit the program that, uh, uh, or the, um, what I will be presenting today. So I'll start with a very simple introduction. Uh, you already have seen um, some of the most important equations in this summer school. So the wave equation with Carlos, the Navier Stoke um, with Mas Moody. So today, we, at this now, you will see the Schrodinger equation. And then, um, of course, we have been working and we have been talking a lot about um, uh, dispersive equation and with them, the Strickert's estimates. And then I will move to, uh, well, I it here you see weak turbulence, but there are many different definitions of weak turbulence. <coughs> uh, this is a very, very weak weak turbulence. Um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about that. And then I'm um, going to look at the Schrodinger equation as an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. And as such, um, people have been trying to prove for this infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system a lot of the really cool and difficult problems um, and results that uh, come up for a finite dimensional Hamiltonian system. Um, one of the problems I will look at is the Gibbs measure, uh, its definition and its use. And then um, the Gibbs measure will bring up a probabilistic approach to the questions of well poseness, local <coughs> and global for dispersive equation, and with that, um, randomization of initial data. And then if I have time at the end, I will uh, uh, mention another problem which is linked to with oh, uh, with the infinite, with the dispersive equation as the infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system, that's no squeezing theorem, and there are recent results on that. And I would like to conclude with some open problems. Okay, so as I promise, the star of this talk is the Schrodinger equation. So basically, this is what you should look <coughs> at. This is the equation. I is of course the complex number, and this is the nonlinearity. My nonlinearity is p. P is going to be greater than one. <coughs> And lambda is going to be uh, either plus or minus one, and that depends whether you're looking at focusing or defocusing problem. And Carlos already mentioned the difference that you can see uh, when you look at the Hamiltonian or the energy, if you want. Uh, what I wanted to you, you to pay attention at is the fact that uh, most of my the questions that I will address are in the periodic case. In other words, my x is in the torus of dimension n. Now, there is a, an important point that I want to make, which is linked with, the, with this uh, torus, and I will stress more later. Uh, we talk about tori that are rational or irrational. Uh, just let me say from the beginning, I will go back to this later. Uh, the rational torus is a torus which has uh, um, periods such that when you take a rash, um, the ratio between them, you always obtain a rational number. And they are irrational if, uh, for example, think about one of the peers to be an irrational number. And the other one, rational, that will be um, the case. But I will anyway, I'll go back to this in a second. And this equation and this initial value problem, um, it's relevant in many situations. And they come, obviously, from physics. I will give you a, a very short, in a short moment, a little bit of one ad an idea. Uh, but the way you look at them, or the kind of problems you solve for them, um, involve quite a lot of different subjects in mathematics. So harmonic analysis, obviously, we like is, these are waves, so we chop them up in small pieces and so we recombine them somehow. So uh, harmonic analysis, clearly Fourier analysis, we do a lot of things with the Fourier transform. Um, analytic grammar theory, when I will go to the uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, the statement, at least, of the Strickert's estimates, and I will tell you something, a uh, place where you use that. Probability, we'll be talking about measures. And dynamical systems, that's, for example, when you look at uh, the question of weak turbulence, and more. Now, of course, all you're going to see here, it's, you feel like it's going to be 
there are easy questions and easy answers, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And I just wanted to present the easy version of uh, this deep problem so that uh, you have at least an idea. Um, so, um, like I said, this problem comes from physics and one of the really interesting questions, which I'm not going to address at all, but uh, is uh, um, obtaining this guy as a limit, either as the number of particles go to infinity or the temperature goes to the absolute zero, of a phenomenon called Bose-Einstein <laughs> condensate. And uh, there is a lot of work done, and there are many, many uh, developments that happened in the last 10 years. Um, Natasha Pavlovich, who is here, uh, yeah, she has been working on this limit. I worked a little bit on this limit. And it's interesting, and it's not at all trivial, to take the limit from the many particles that are governed by certain Hamiltonians and obtain as a limit, in a certain sense, these equations. And uh, I like a lot this picture that appeared in uh, Science in 1995, because actually in 1995, a uh, couple of teams working on the, um, on the phenomenological aspect of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So with experiments, got a Nobel Prize. So really what happens is all these guys, think of them particles, if you are, let's say, in a higher temperature, they are all independently doing their stuff. But as you lower the, the, the temperature, they, they kind of lose their own identity, they reassemble as a wave. And basically this wave is the solution of the Schrodinger equation. Now when you model uh, a certain phenomenon via uh, an initial value problem, the first thing you want to do is at least check that that system, the initial value problem, has a solution. <coughs> That's the least of your worries. Um, now you of course want the uh, uniqueness as well when possible. You want stability and uh, you've seen in the both um, lectures this morning that these are fundamental questions. And we have in some cases, I mean the cases that we can treat, pretty good understanding of what happens in small time or for small data, but the long time dynamics is a very complicated problem and I, I think you got an idea from this morning already. So the questions of stability and long time, in particular long time stability and so on, is very hard. But let's first um, start with the small uh, problems and like that of existence and uniqueness of solutions. And uh, let me go back for a second to, if you consider this problem here, um, the one way of solving it um, is by reducing it to an integral equation via the Duhamel principle. And uh, you saw already this, uh, uh, Carlos used the same um, word, this, that was for the wave, this is for the Schrodinger, but this is the linear solution of the problem. And then here you have the non-homogeneous piece, so it's again the, the operator acting now on the non-linearity, that H that Carlos mentioned. Um, so as a first step, when you want to find the solution for this uh, integral equation, you see clearly that if you define an operator like the right hand side, the fixed point is a solution. And uh, in order to um, understand where in which space you want to do the fixed point, then you start thinking, well, I'm thinking about this uh, right hand side as a perturbation of the linear problem. So let me prove as many um, estimates as possible the linear problem that will uh, give me the intuition of what should be the norms of my space and then cook up that space with those es via those estimates and prove that this other sort of piece here is a perturbation. And you usually can do that for um, you know, small data, um, lower or subcritical um, in a certain sense, um, nonlinearities, small time and so on. So that's the first step. So because I say you want to think of this problem as the perturbation of the linear part, let's look at the linear part. So we look at the linear part and uh, the simple way of uh, solving this linear problem is just by taking Fourier transfer. In other words, you think of V as uh, the, remember we are in the periodic case here and I'm giving this uh, uh, very simple minded um, uh, presentation by thinking I'm in one dimension. If you are in higher dimension, slightly more complicated, I'll get to that in a second. So you just look at it by thinking that V is going to be a um, periodic function, it's going to be written via a certain coefficient with respect to your uh, L2 basis. And what are these coefficients? Well, these coefficients will satisfy this ODE for fixed K. So for each fixed K, your solution AKT is this guy here, where 
u hat zero is exactly the Fourier coefficient k of the initial data, and then you can reconstruct via the anti-Fourier transfer, that's what you have. So then you say, well, I actually have a, a completely explicit form of the linear problem. So it's going to be very easy to find a bunch of estimates for it because it's completely explicit. Well, that's not the case especially in higher dimensions. So let me tell you what it looks like when you are in higher dimension. Just by repeating the same argument, you will end up with this expression here. And here in the one-dimensional case, you have the k square. In the uh, n-dimensional case, you're going to get a gamma k, which is this object, which is positive. The ki is a k1 up to kn are the component of my vectors in n dimension. And these ci's are going to be related to the periods okay, or in whatever direction you go. And now this is the point um, of having a torus which is rational or irrational. If all these CIs are rational numbers, then the torus is rational. If there is one which is at least one which is irrational, then um, it's an irrational torus, unless you can divide by it. But let's just pretend that we can, they don't have common factors. And now, um, Let's go to the estimates that you want to go to, uh, want to do for these solutions, and these are the Strickhardt estimate, and let's see how the rationality or irrationality of this torus plays a role. Now, <coughs> excuse me, from the point of view of physics, there shouldn't be any difference, okay? I mean, at least that's what we believe, but the, from the point of view of doing mathematics with it, there is a difference. So these are the Strickhardt estimates that Burgen listed for us. This goes back to early 90s. And uh, um, he proved some of them uh, using, in fact, uh, some uh, concept from analytic number theory. And why, just let me make this point, why analytic number theory, not just analysis? Well, in the case in which instead of the torus of dimension n, you are in Rn, um, the solution of the linear problem is an oscillatory integral. And if you do integration by parts, you can get nice um, decays, estimates, or uh, you can use um, theorems that go back to restriction of the Fourier transform of a certain hypersurface that have a non-zero Gaussian curvature, like the parabola, which is attached to the Schrodinger equation. So you can do a lot of things. But in the case of periodic um, situations, these oscillatory integrals now become oscillatory sums, and they are much more complicated to address, and they are treated in, um, in analytic number theory. So that's why he uses those methods. Um, now, I don't want you to look at all these P's and Q's and things like that. What I really want to pay attention is uh, um, the following. So here I'm doing the, this. I'm taking the linear evolution of a, a certain function, and that function has Fourier transform which localizes in a ball center n0 radius n. So in Fourier transform, you are in this ball, located anywhere, x0, it's just n0, sorry, is anywhere in uh, my space of the frequency, and the radius is n. And then I'm uh, uh, estimating this uh, uh, LQT, LQX norms, finite in time. You do not expect a global in time street cards, um, in fact. Uh, and then what you see here on the right hand side is the L2 norm. Why the L2 norm? Well, the L2 norm is uh, uh, very important for the Schrodinger. It's actually invariant. Um, it's a one of the invariant uh, um, norms for all quantities for the Schrodinger equation. So you want to measure via that. <laughs> and what you see here in red is uh, how much you might lose in doing your estimate. So um, let me actually give you a specific example so that uh, you can fix the idea a little bit. So I'm considering now the L4 estimate, which is the one for T2, torus of dimension 2. And uh, um, in the rational case, which was considered by Bourguin um, early 90s, think of C1 and C2, for example, <coughs> being one or natural number. And uh, if you write down what this L4 norm is, you can write it as the L2 norm of uh, STU0 time, STU0. You use um, Plancharel, you do the convolutions, and at the end, what uh, he has to estimate is the number of lattice points that are on circles, 
Now think of C1 and C2 to be 1, so will be the circle radius R, R, R. And there is a, um, a theorem in analytic number theory that tells you how many of those numbers you have in terms of how large the circle is, and this is what it, go, it does. Now if you replace the circle with an ellipse, then the situation is not at all as clear as this, and the reason why um, you cannot conclude this Strickert's estimate in the case in which you have an ellipse which corresponds to the case in which you have different period, particular um, uh, rational, well then you, know, you don't have such an estimate so you have a much weaker result. And that's where the situation stand, stand for several years and there was other contribution that came um, in order to find out if you really have the same Strickert's estimate for these irrational situations, but there were partial results. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, instead, um, a paper appeared by Burgen and Demeter on the proof of the L2 decoupling uh, conjecture. I'm not going to write here what the decoupling conjecture is, but as a consequence of that, um, they show that actually the Strickert's um, estimates in any dimension and basically in full generality except for this extra little bit of loss of derivative which I put here in, in blue um, are true. Now uh, I just wanted to point it out that the proof of the L2 decoupli conjecture from which this is derived as a corollary it's purely from uh, given from a harmonic analysis point of view. In fact um, that depends, beside the traditional harmonic analysis, in some um, new addition to it, which uh, is the, uh, oh, was there before too, but in particular, in particular it's very much used in this proof, um, incident geometry theory. And uh, Larry Gusta had uh, um, a work that uh, was related to the Kakea conjecture, but anyway, that he had done by using this incident geometry and combined all of that. Um, Burgen and Demeter were able to prove the decoupling conjecture as a consequence of that, this. And uh, that proof sees no rationality, irrationality, everything is the same. Um, so it's a completely different proof than the original one that uh, Burgen gave. And I wanted to say that uh, um, on this kind of approach there is all the work of uh, um, Wolf and Burgen Goose and uh, Gario Seeger and so on. It's a very interesting uh, branch of mathematics. Okay, so now let me move on. Um, so since this result of uh, uh, Burgen and Demeter, we now know that we can address, uh, you know, in um, the, the results that were proven before via the Strickart system only for the rational in terms of well posons now are also true for the irrational torus. Now let me remind you a couple of conservation laws for the equation. I already mentioned the L2 norm. Here it is, that's corresponding to the mass. But there is also another piece of it which is the Hamiltonian and which for the Schrodinger is the gradient square and then here is the nonlinearity, the nonlinear part. And like I said, if we are in the defocusing case then uh, this lambda is 1 and so this quantity, the Hamiltonian, is always positive. We, so we are not in the situation that Carlos needed, well, we are in the situation that Carlos dismissed this morning at the beginning because uh, uh, we are going to be thinking about this. Uh, um, in the periodic case, this is still, um, still an open question. The, defo the focusing case in the periodic case is really hard. Okay, so. Um, Let's put ourselves for now in the defocusing case and let me, uh, for you, like I said, I'm going to present the, the simplest uh, possible problems in this context so that you can understand what's going on. So this is uh, a theorem that goes back several years of Bourgain and uh, you take, so we are in dimension 2, so that's where the L4 norm of the street cards is important. We have a cubic nonlinearity. This problem is the L2 critical in the sense that uh, if you do rescaling like Carlos was doing today, the L2 norm is left invariant. And uh, um, Hiburgen proved using the Strickart's estimates that this problem is uh, global, uh, sorry, it's locally well posed in HS for S strictly greater than zero, but by using the Hamiltonian, it's also globally well posed for data U0 in H1. 
There is also some partial result of global level poisons below, strict, a little bit below H1 by using the um, I method, but I will not talk about that. But the point is that the point that I want to make now is that if you take initial data that are smooth enough, AUR and the defocusing case, you have a global solution. Okay, so now once you have a global solution, we also call a global flow, then there are many questions you want to ask. For example, how does it look like this global solution? And one of the uh, questions that I wanted to address here is the question of weak turbulence. Now, for me, um, weak turbulence in this context only means that if you start with an initial data which is localized in frequency near zero, let's say, um, do you know whether or not the um, this, this uh, um, localized solution, localized initial data, as t goes to infinity, moves in high frequency. So this we call forward cascade. So you, the, this is something that uh, uh, is not um, intuitive uh, a priori because the conservation of the L2 norm and the conservation of the Hamiltonian, it's uh, um, constrained the solution in a certain way. Um, but whether you can have these frequencies or the bulk of the solution move from uh, living near zero, which was at time zero, to live farther away, it's a complicated question and uh, like I say, goes under the name of forward cascade. And let me immediately say that you cannot have any of this forward cascade if you have scattering. Why? Because scattering means that as t goes to infinity, the solution becomes basically linear. And uh, any linear solution has uh, um, an HS norm, which is here, which remains bounded. And if the HS norm remains bounded, then the bulk of the solution in terms of frequency cannot be too far away in terms of k, because otherwise it would be picked up from this norm since it has this weight here. So if the u hat tk gets bigger, then when you hit it with the weight k, as t goes to infinity, that will become bigger as well. But if you have scattering that's basically linear, any linear solution has the HS norm bounded, hence that cannot happen. Um, another um, possibly enemy for weak um, turbulence in this sense is uh, complete integrability. Like if you have a bunch of conservation laws, and you, you can recombine them in some way, and this conservation law have uh, a piece of it which is related to the HS norm, then you, can, you are able to sort of um, control the whole HS norm as S becomes an uh, arbitrary positive number. So scattering and complete integrability might, um, you know, uh, might be your enemies for the weak turbulence, um, so you have to worry about that. But in the general case that I'm considering, which is this periodic case, we do not expect scattering. And we put ourselves in the non-complete uh, non integrability situation. So for example, dimension two um, cubic is not integrable. Um, so let me give you a couple of theorems. This one are relatively old theorems by now, in a sense. But just as an example of what has been uh, approved in the context of this uh, weak turbulence in the way I mentioned. So the first, uh, so there are two things that you would like to say. Uh, you would like to say that uh, this uh, HS norm, although they might grow, they don't grow too much in terms of time. So these are bound from above. And then you also would like to say that you can exhibit at least a solution for which there is a growth and uh, somehow this is bound from below. So let me explain a little bit uh, what this theorem says. So the first one says, take the solution of uh, Bourgain, the one um, that I already told you exists globally in the defocusing case. Then since that the global result is obtained via an iteration, the trivial bound is an exponential bound in T. And you wanted to do better than that, and in fact you can, and you can prove that uh, the bound cannot be stronger than uh, at least T to the S. So of course, if S is one, then you have a uniform bound that comes from the Hamiltonian. But if F is S is greater than one, um, this is what we know, that it's polynomial. We expect much better bound than that, maybe log of T, um, but um, that's what we have so far. So this tells you that it cannot grow too much. Now the question is, can you actually have a growth? 
Um, so one of the theorem that uh, were proved a few years ago, this is I proved with my collaborator. Um, so take T2, which is rational. <coughs> In fact, I'm not uh, sure that this proof holds for the rational case. Um, I think one should check that. Um, so just to be safe, let's uh, think of this to be rational. There is a construction that happens in terms of the set of frequencies, so um, that needs to be redone somehow. Anyway, uh, let's think of it to be a rational torus. Um, let's take S, which is greater than 1, and K, which is a large um, positive quantity, and sigma, which is a very small positive quantity. Then we can construct a solution for our cubic two-dimensional periodic problem, uh, defocusing, let's call it uxt, such that at time zero was of this size for the HS norm, so less than sigma, but if you wait long enough, it's going to be as big as this quantity k. Now, this theorem is not enough in order to um, show that you actually have a growth in time, no even logarithmic growth. Um, so it, this is uh, much less than what we would like to have. And after we uh, prove this theorem, there has been a lot of work related to this and much more improved to that. So uh, strictly related to this is the work of Guardia Kaloshin than there is for the Quintic NLS. There is the uh, work of uh, House Prochesi, and there's some more recent work of, of Guardia House Prochesi. And for a different kind of system, there is a beautiful work of Patrick Gerard Grelier and uh, uh, Gerard and collaborators. So, but that's just to give you an idea of uh, where we are. There are lots of open questions here. Okay. So let me move on um, and think of now of uh, um, my Schrodinger equation as an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system. I will show you, ah, sorry, this is a, uh, maybe, hmm, maybe, you know, I skip this because I think that I will not be able, here we go. So um, let's now think of our uh, Schrodinger equation as a, a periodic Schrodinger as an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system. Uh, I will tell you in a moment how you do that. But before going to the infinite dimension, let's recall a few things that come from a finite dimension. Okay, so this is the way we write, uh, or you see written, um, a finite dimension Hamiltonian system. So we have two variables, um, Q and P. <coughs> um, there is the Hamiltonian H, which depends on Q and P. And there is uh, um, the equation q dot equals partial derivative of h with respect to p, and p dot equals minus partial derivative of h with respect to q. Um, and then if you uh, look at the derivative with respect to t of h, when h is evaluated on the solution of the system, you see with a simple calculation that actually is zero. So in particular, h itself is a conserved quantity. Now, um, I say we are looking at finite dimension now, so let's call it y to be q1 to, to qk, and then p1 to pk, and this is just as a vector, so that's why I put the transport here, and the transpose, and this is r to 2k, and 2k equals z in my dimension. You can also rewrite in this uh, um, maybe more compact way, which looks a lot more like a Schrodinger equation, and where j is 0, minus uh, 1, minus 1, and 0. Okay, so that's my finite dimension. So what can we say about this system? Um, actually, we can say very easily a bunch of things. So the first one is that uh, via Neuville's theorem that you see recalled here. So let's recall it for a moment again. So let a vector field f from rd to rd be divergence free. That's very important. Then the map phi t, which is really the flow map relative to this ODE. Now here I'm talking about ODE, of course. Uh, leaves the volume or the Lebesgue measure, if you like, the finite dimensional Lebesgue measure or the volume, if you want, invariant. Okay, so what does that mean that leaves that invariant? It says that if I take a set A and then I evolve it through phi of t, then the measure of A and the measure of the evolution, phi of t of A at any t, is the same. Okay, so now for a, a Hamiltonian system, Liouville theorem is uh, applicable because in particular you have that uh, the, this right-hand side here for the Hamiltonian system is divergence-free. 
Hence, as a consequence, any um, Hamiltonian flow leaves the Lebesgue measure invariant or the volume measure invariant. That's a triviality. Mean, it's very simple. Um, so now, slowly, let me walk to you through the Gibbs measure. In finite dimension, it's also trivial to prove that the Gibbs measure is invariant. So first of all, what is the Gibbs measure? Well, the Gibbs measure is uh, the volume measure. Now, this makes sense. It's just like the uh, volume of the parallel part, if you like. Then there's this exponential. Beta is just a positive quantity. Don't worry too much about that. This is the Hamiltonian. And this constant here is just to normalize so that the measure of mu of your space is 1. OK, so now if um, we are looking at, uh, um, again, the Hamiltonian flow, then my claim is that uh, that flow leaves also this mu invariant. This is called the Gibbs measure. Why does it leave it invariant? Well, it's pretty trivial. This part, it's finite. I mean, this, we are talking about finite dimensions. This d is finite. It's invariant. It's the volume measure, and that's invariant through the Liouville theorem. This part is also invariant because h, we just know that it's a conserved quantity. So as long as I stay along the Hamiltonian flow, that h stays invariant. So all together is invariant. Okay. So this is very simple, but what happens when I try to do something like this in infinite dimension Hamiltonian system? So let me give you an example of one infinite dimension Hamiltonian system that comes from a Schrodinger. Now, in, uh, um, in this um, context, I wanted to uh, give you a very simple example. In fact, I'm going to give you the one in one dimension. And I will tell you a little bit more when you are in higher dimension what happens. So we start with, uh, let's say, this equation. I'm looking here at the quintic nonlinearity. I could have taken the cubic as well, but the result that I wanted to mention, which is, which is relevant and important, is uh, Oborgen. It makes sense also in the quintic case. So I want to present that. Um, you have an initial data, u0x, and x now is in t. And here, t is just uh, a circle. So there is no problem about rational and irrational. There is no meaning of that. There is just one circle, one period. But when you go to higher dimension, that becomes an issue. I just wanted to announce this. The Hamiltonian is, like I mentioned before, is the gradient. And then there is one third of this is uh, the, I don't know if this, this constant is correct, but it's a positive constant. I'm looking at the one six. One six. One six thank you. Yeah, I thought that was one six. OK, the point is there is a positive here. So this is a positive Hamiltonian. All right, so then um, this problem here can be written as an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system in the following sense. Take u and look at it in terms of real coefficients. It's going to be a real part and an imaginary part. So ak is my real part, bk is an imaginary part. And can I rewrite this problem um, by exactly like the infinite, like the um, um, Hamiltonian equation that I gave you before, except that now the k are infinitely many. k belongs to z. Um, so, sorry, this I wrote the zn, but in my case, in this particular case, n is equal 1. But in general, you can write in any dimension, of course. So it's an infinite dimension of uh, this vector a k b k is uh, an infinite dimension vector. So you have to be careful, <coughs> for example, to understand what you mean with the Gibbs measure. So remember before, in the finite dimension case, the Gibbs measure was the, <coughs> the exponential minus uh, the Hamiltonian. And then there was uh, uh, the volume part in there. So you would like to make sense of something like this. Well, exponential or minus beta the Hamiltonian. This, you can imagine, that makes sense, because this is just a, a conserved quantity. But what doesn't make any sense whatsoever is this guy here, which is an infinite volume. OK, so really. Um, as it is, uh, we cannot understand what it means. And that's why I put it in quotation marks. Um, but Leibovitz, Rose, and Speer um, proved that uh, you can, in fact, make sense of this measure as long as you, are, um, you consider the measure in a, a certain uh, space. And in fact, you can make sense of this thinking of mu to be a measure in, a, let's say, HS tau, so the uh, Sobol space, but s has to be strictly less than a half. If you are a half or bigger, you cannot. This doesn't make any sense. So the regularity of the space where you work, if you want to define the Gibbs measure, is very low. And it gets worse and worse as you go higher in dimension. 
So um, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, so um, how do you make sense? How did um, uh, Lebowitz, Rosenspear and Zitkova actually too made sense of this measure? Well, let's step back a little bit and let's um, look again at the Hamiltonian. So here is the Hamiltonian. You can also add the L to norm. I say that's conserved as well. So let's consider this whole piece here, which is invariant. Um, this was the original Hamiltonian, positive quantity, and then I also added the L to norm, which was invariant. And now let's think of it as a two different pieces. The, the part that comes from the linear part uh, of the problem, in a sense, so it's the gradient and the L to norm right here. So that's the, the what I call the linear part of the Hamiltonian. And then there is the other part. Ah, you see, Frank, I put six there now. So kind of new, but anyway. So uh, this is the nonlinear part, right? There is a minus here. And this part, well, we didn't really do much. We didn't make much more sense of this stuff because still there is the volume piece, which is an infinite dimension. So we have to take care of that. But we can recognize um, something that we understand, this part here. This is the Gaussian measure. And there is a lot of literature on that. If you are interested, there are books and books written on it. And the Gaussian measure makes sense. So what I put still in quotation mark here makes sense. So in the next slides, I'll tell you how you do that. So this part makes sense. Um, but you still have to take care of this. And what you have to do is uh, to show that uh, uh, this piece is in L1 with respect to the Gaussian measure. And so you can think of it as a um, random Nicodym derivative. So in a very short um, sl one slice uh, argument, I told you how you can make sense of this Gibbs measure. In practice, it requires a lot of calculations, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, so since I mentioned the Gaussian measure, let me just briefly tell you um, how you deal with it. So the first thing you do is, as a, a lot of things in this infinite dimension Hamiltonian system, you just truncate. You truncate and find it main in the boxes of frequencies of size n. You use a lot of finite dimension stuff that happens there, that you know how it works. And then you have to take the limit. And taking the limit is usually the hard part, of course. But once you truncate, so you take frequencies that are less than n, then this makes sense. This is the, volumes, um, the volume measure in a um, finite dimension setting now, in R, N, uh, R, I don't know how many dimensions. But anyway, finite many dimension here. Um, this makes sense. So this uh, finite dimension uh, rho n um, makes sense. And you can also prove that uh, if you, um, well, let me just leave it at that. I don't want to go back to the infinite system. And another thing that you can say is that uh, um, when well, there is a measure, so there is a probability um, underlining uh, background to this measure. And the way you can think about that is the following. So you can take the map that goes from <coughs> little omega to this quantity. So now little omega belongs in a probability space big omega p. p is the probability. And induce map from uh, the big omega to the uh, functions that uh, I'm considering is made like this. You go from little omega to g k omega over uh, square root of 1 plus k square. This is uh, um, a uh, Fourier coefficient. coefficient. In fact, I want to give the name of v hat k omega and this guy here. And you can reconstruct it, your function via um, the inverse Fourier transform in the following way. So phi omega x is going to be this Fourier coefficient, e to the kx. And in other words, it's also written like that. OK, so uh, these are very special functions. Um, because as you see, the Fourier coefficient is very special. Um, in fact, it's made by 1 over square root of this guy times gk omega. gk omega is a random variable. You have to put assumptions for kind of random variable. But the point is that you require them to be independent. And the uh, independence of these random variables are going to uh, help you quite a lot when you have to do multilinear estimates. And again, I'm not going to go into the details, but um, the way you should think of in these problems is that your initial data are going to be of this type. So they are generic in a sense that uh, this omega varies in here, but otherwise they are pretty um, 
specific data. Okay, um, by using that, this particular data, Bourguin proved that this problem, this is uh, the um, quintic NLS one dimension, um, is globally well posed almost surely in a space HS where S is has to be below one half because you're going to use the measure. And not just that, the Gibbs measure, which I told you briefly how you define it uh, before, is invariant with respect to the whole flow of uh, uh, given by this problem. Um, now, uh, a couple of remarks that I want to make is that uh, um, when you, you can do this also in the focusing case, which is, I would say, even more interesting, but in that case, you have to impose a restriction on the L2 norm in order to make sense of the measure itself. And that restriction is that the L2 has to be smaller than a certain constant. Not an epsilon, but some uh, uh, definite constant in there. And then um, another remark that I want to make is the following. Um, the important um, contribution of Bourguin in this direction, which you can already see in one dimension, but really it's much more um, uh, so much stronger in a two-dimensional case is that, uh, um, well, you can prove um, well poisons, global well poisons at levels in which you do not have conservation law. So, for example, at one half minus epsilon. So, the the case in which um, that I show you at the beginning, uh, like the global well poison that I, I show you before, Bourguin was using the Hamiltonian, the conservation of the Hamiltonian. Here instead what you use is the invariance of the measure. And even more impressive is the fact that you can prove this, like I say, even the focusing case um, in which you basically show that what happens in the focusing or defocus is uh, uh, according, once you sift through with this measure is the same. Um, so uh, the, the result is exactly a, uh, just a one half minus for those particular initial data that I mentioned before. And it's in order to um, prove um, some kind of propagation of regularity is not as trivial as uh, uh, when you prove well poisonous in a deterministic way. So you have to do a little bit of work. And uh, just I'm going to close here. Let's see, because I see that. The Okay, never mind. Let's go that. I don't have time to do it. Um, but this whole um, um, probabilistic approach on uh, dispersive equation, I didn't even write here the names, all the people have been working on that, but has opened up quite a lot of different directions, um, in particular in situations in which there are a contraexample for deterministic multilinear estimates that we cannot be. That that tell, tells us that we cannot really try to hope for deterministic results of well-posedness. And uh, also a lot of uh, um, different um, approach for the problem itself in terms of uh, showing um, questions of uh, um, um, that are related more to probability. So let me just conclude with uh, the, here we go, some open problems. So understanding the Strickart's estimates in a more direct way, the fact that at the moment for irrational tori they are uh, based on the proof of the decoupling conjecture, it's a very restrictive way of thinking about it. A more direct proof will be really um, welcome. Then improved theorem of weak turbulence. Here I just mentioned uh, one recent result. It's I found very interesting by Fall, Honey, and Germain. Um, this is the understanding at Godic structure associated with the problem, which is linked to this uh, Gibbs measure that uh, um, I mentioned. Um, then finding um, theorems that uh, allows you to prove, go from local to global without having to use this Gibbs measure too much because they are very rough when you are in higher dimension. Then use probabilistic approach to study property of discrete version of NLS. So we have been looking at continuous versions here, discrete like with finite dif definitions through finite differences and so on. This, there is interesting work by Chatterjee, Kirkpatrick and Chatterjee. And then I didn't mention, I didn't have time to talk about the um, non-squeezing theorem, but that's uh, another direction in which there are um, some recent, uh, there is some recent work um, and if you want, I can talk to you more about that. Thank you.
Do we have questions? <coughs> you said sigma for the for the uh, the well, yeah. well poisonous. Uh, like, do you have any idea of what it is? Like, is well, in it's a conventional sense. Yeah, it's uh, so the data I already wrote for you. Um, yeah, the data, the initial data looks like this. So it's a G and omega. So let me sum it. So in this particular case uh, of the of the, the the problem that I had there, and this is my phi omega x. So that's how they look like. So Where this other. Uh, Say it again. Sigma is only those. Um, yep, it sets like that. So yeah. Elements like this, and then what changes is the omega, and the omega is gonna be part of uh, let me call them omega tilde, which, uh, and then the point is that the probability, the, this measure, is basically is the same as the one for the invariant measure, of sets like this. Let me call it a. Okay, so then that's how they look like. So they are very specific. And I didn't mention, I mean, this is when uh, you use invariance measure, but there are other results in which you randomize the initial data in a, in a, and there are many more different kind of data than that, but then you cannot use the measure. You have to use other things to go from local to global. Thank you.